that day I live in a dream Welcome to Only Trying to Help, the podcast where we try to help you be helpful to other people. I am Kate Watson, and I've brought back one of my favorite guests, one of my favorite people, really. Um, I think I said this last time you were on, I'm going to say it again. You live too close for us to not see each other face to face more often. I I agree (laughs) with you. Absolutely. Oh, my God. I'm closer to you than I am to New York City. Like, how is that possible? Like, yeah, God. So I'm I'm still mad at us after all this time, but we'll we'll work that out perhaps after the show. Ravi, can you say hello and introduce yourself again and, and remind our folks who you are, where you come from, all that? Absolutely. Well, first off, um, hi everybody, um, and thank you to Kate and uh, for inviting me back, and also for just having this awesome platform to just have conversations and uh, for people to listen in. I, I absolutely love it. Um, I live in New Jersey in the United States. I actually live in central New Jersey. And I, I think I might have said this last time, people may not acknowledge that central New Jersey exists, but it does. It does. Um, I'm originally from the Caribbean islands and I identify as West Indian with my uh, with my parents and my family of origin being from uh, Trinidad. Uh, so also I'm a marriage and family therapist and the proud uh, dad of a 10 year old daughter 10 going on 21. And I love it all. I love all the stages and all the things that I'm learning from her. So that's a little bit about me. I, as you know, I run a company, you may not know that I have a little internship program. So I have some undergraduate interns who are part of the company. And they just got started a couple weeks ago, we were doing an icebreaker, like, you know, tell us a fun fact about yourself. And this young man who's an intern with my company introduced himself and his the thing he wanted us to know about him he said i believe there is such thing as central new jersey (laughs) no way (laughs) oh my god this is such a like it's such a regional fun fact like the only people where we live would understand why that's something you disclose about yourself (laughs) i know right and if anyone that's listening in wants to go onto a map uh, the big discussion is Newark, New Jersey. Anything south of that is considered South Jersey. Uh, and everything else is northern New Jersey, <laughs> which is just, if you look at the map, that's insane. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how much of this podcast we want to eat up talking about this, but I turned on the news one morning months ago in Philadelphia, where I live, and local news was reporting like that New Jersey government was was passing a law declaring Central Jersey. And I was like, yeah. really? Yeah, <laughs> it is so, so funny. Yeah, I definitely got a screenshot of that from my friends that live in northern New Jersey. Uh, and they wrote hoax <laughs> in their text to me. So uh, pretty, pretty fun stuff. Like it's it's just actually good. It's 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 good banter to have back and forth. It is. It's like the Loch Ness monster. Like, do you believe or not? Right, and, right. and you're a you're a believer. I'm a believer. You know, like zoom in on that photo. You're gonna see you're gonna see Central Jersey somewhere. Um, thanks for that, Ravi. And you know, before we started recording, you and I were just catching up on life, and I was asking about your family. And it seems like we discovered there's a lot to say about the ever shifting roles in families. Um and it, it it's fascinating to me. And I know as a marriage and family therapist, you could probably go on for days about this, but I feel like we work so hard to define our roles in a family just for them to change when we're in middle age. What do you think about that? Uh, I absolutely love how you say that. Um, we work hard and there's, uh, there's, there's an evolution that everyone goes through. Uh, we can call it growth. We can call it uh, just over time. Um, You know, some of us are pretty consistent in our family roles and some of us break out of a shell or, you know, kind of do things that we didn't traditionally do when we were younger. Um, I am the fourth uh, uh, of four kids, so I'm the baby of the family. And I definitely didn't really um, 
appreciate being the baby of the family uh, when I was growing up because my siblings made it known that I was, you know, they used the S word that I was spoiled and I probably was, but um, here we are now. And as the baby of the family, uh, one of the things that is a, a big part of all of our lives out of my, uh, of my brothers and my brother and sisters is that um, we have parents that are going to medical appointments and they require uh, more attention that they did when we were kids. It was, we were the ones that were going to the medical appointments, right? So um, it's, it's, it's fascinating to recognize as we are seeing our parents, if we're fortunate enough, obviously, uh, you know, uh, not everyone has their, uh, their parents with them. Uh, and to be able to be part of that journey with them, that they're going to medical appointments and hearing diagnoses and it's not just uh, continue to take your vitamins. There's some things that are coming up and it's the way it plays out for your role in the family. It It's definitely, um, I think change is the right word, adjustment. Um, it could be a shock, but it's definitely a thing when that happens. Yeah. I am. Um, well, the audience will know, you know, I have a, a friend who comes on the show from time to time, Elizabeth, who's a social worker who works with older adults. And she she made this great point. She corrected me one time and I was so grateful she did because I, I, I immediately converted to her way of thinking when she corrected me. I said something about how you grow up and then you start parenting your parents. And she said, no, you don't. And I and I and I paused. I went, oh, what? What, what, what did I say wrong? Cause I've always heard that phrase. Like you start parenting right. your parents. Absolutely. She, she said, roles may shift, things may change, but you are never the parents of your parents. And she, as a social worker who works with older adults, hears this from the older adults a lot. Like my kids think they're the parent now. They are not the parent now. And I wonder if that comes up either in your work or in your life, Ravi, uh, that idea of parenting the parents. Oh yeah, there. It's um, it's definitely a, a this dance that I have, um, and I, I could speak from my experience of uh, when I feel like I begin to parent my parents, it feels like I'm stepping on their toes, right? Like so, when you're dancing, you step on someone's toe. Um, and when I was younger, if I was dancing with someone and I stepped on their toe, I would get so nervous, I'd go forward and I'd step on the other foot. <laughs> I'd step on the other toe. <laughs> so that was just what I did. And fortunately, I learned that when you step on someone's toe, you either pause or you take a step back. Right. And um, I definitely have felt better knowing that it does happen occasionally, you know, from time to time. But also recognizing that, yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly that our parents uh, are the ones that took care of us. And uh, they raised us and they will always have that uh, that title of parent. Uh, very similarly, I'll always have that title of um, child uh, with them when they look at me. They're never going to look at me and say, this is my parent, right? They're going to say, this is my adult son. This is, this is my baby. Um, and those are some of the dynamics that I feel play out uh, and... We see it in sitcoms. We kind of laugh about it. We joke about it. But um, there's some strong feelings there. Um, definitely working. Uh, I've, I've worked with um, adults that are in uh, later stages of their life. Uh, you know, we have uh, geriatric units here in New Jersey. Um, aging in is what we also call it. Um, and similarly, I've definitely gained an appreciation in speaking with uh, individuals that are just like, no one's listening to me and they're treating me like I'm a kid. Like, I don't know how to take care of myself and I'm just tired and this hurts and I can't do the things that they're asking me to do. And those are some of the things that I'd love to talk a little bit more about is when we as adult kids, I guess you could say that, right? Uh, when we see our parents, uh, we we tend to feel away and we don't talk about how we feel. It's scary. It's terrifying. We don't want to see our parents uh, have a medical condition that is uh, making them feel uncomfortable. The same way they don't want it to happen to us. And 
the stigma is that we don't really talk about it. We we tend to joke about it and we tend to get frustrated and say, did you take your pills? Why aren't you going for a walk? You need to exercise. You need to get out of the house. And even in that tone that I just said, lecture, right? Uh, that's not partnership. That's uh, kind of uh, judgment. You know, you really have to do that. And I think I've seen a lot of people where that's all coming out of fear. Uh, we don't want to lose our parents. We don't want them to to be in pain. So um, definitely lots, lots and lots to talk about when it comes to what's happening to us and what are we feeling. And I guess I wonder if we, if we started there, if we said, mom, dad, let me just begin by saying, I'm kind of worried. Uh, wow. As soon as you said that, the, the hair is in the back of my neck stood up, right? Because what, what happens when we share how we're feeling, right? And especially if it's something that might put them in a position of feeling weird or feeling or feeling a thing. And I probably should also say it evokes fear, but it also evokes other feelings, right? Um, it, there, so I don't want to just put that label that it's only fear. Uh, you can, as you're listening to this, you can feel a whole range of emotions based on your relationship with your parents, uh, the culture that you were raised in, uh, how close or far you're living to them or some some of us are living with them. And when when that happens, when we think about saying, um, you know, I'm feeling scared, um, one of the things that I feel prevents us from saying that is that we don't want to put the burden back on them. We don't want them to feel bad, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to carry these emotions, whatever they are, and we're going to carry them with us because we need to be stronger for them. And uh, yes, and also maybe there are other ways to share your emotions. Uh, if not with them, uh, I know that there's a lot of support groups in New Jersey. There's a lot of, uh, it, actually, if you just uh, Google national support group for caregivers, uh, you'll see um, various states have uh, anonymous uh, call lines where you can just call in and talk to somebody and just share what you're feeling. And so there's the route of telling them directly, which of course, that's great. Uh, there's the route of calling um, a helpline. And then there's also the route of um, building your supports or maintaining your supports that you have. Uh, so I can share with my, uh, with my friends. Um, I can share with my siblings that uh, what I'm experiencing. Um, so there's definitely a lot of options we have there. Um, what what are your thoughts on if you share with your with your parents that uh, I'm scared? Like what 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 comes to mind for you? Because that that was my reaction. Well, I guess it to me it's it's a, an honest way of saying here's where I'm coming from. Because as you mentioned, Ravi, like you could decide I'm just going to hold on to all this, and I'm I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to burden people. But it's going to come out anyway. So like, if it's going to come out in me saying, take your medication, use the walker, you're supposed to go to the doctor this week. Like if, if that's how it's going to come out, well, that's worse. Right. Yeah, and so I'd rather it come out in like a, uh, I'm trying not to use the word controlled. Cause I know that's the control freak in me. <laughs> uh, I'd rather it come out in a composed way um, in a way that says, like, I, I'm not falling apart here. I just want to be honest and say, I'm yeah. worried about you. And to me, that statement is far better than it's seeping out in some way that I didn't mean for it to come out. And all my fears turning into very controlling behaviors of shouting at them or calling them 10 times a day or nagging them. That's how our fears and worries seep out when we try and tuck them away. Um, and I guess that's what I was thinking. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's, that's a, that's a great way of looking at it because, um, and as you were talking, I was visualizing like a, a volcano, right? And it doesn't mean that the volcano is going to erupt and it's going to be this huge thing, but uh, even with volcanoes, they might be dormant, but uh, inside it's really hot right and the lava is like brewing um so that in itself is just not 
we we know that that's not healthy to keep it brewing inside. And if it seeps out a little bit uh, versus having like a moment where you just kind of let it all out at once. And then there's the guilt and the shame and, uh, oh, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have done that. And then you start rationalizing. I shouldn't have done that, but I shouldn't have, um, you know, been a little mean or I could have been nicer, but also I'm scared or I'm frustrated or I'm insert what you're feeling right there. So isn't it amazing how it comes down to healthy communication and direct communication? <laughs> yeah, it does. And, and some self-awareness, you know, to, to know, like I'm thinking about, um, you know, even the title of the show is only trying to help. And it's, it's a, a phrase that I think we say when we are defending ourselves, like we've already, we've already tried to do something. It didn't go well. And yes. rather, and rather than saying, Oh, that didn't go well. Let me try something else. We just defend ourselves. We say, no, I'm only trying to help you. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a defensive move. So rather than getting yourself all the way down that road where you've now done something annoying and you're trying to defend yourself, yeah. why don't we, why don't we just open with, I care about you and I'm worried about your health and your well being, And I just thought I should say that out loud. Mm. Wow. So what I'm hearing is just a little, a little uh, alternative in the beginning of communicating with someone, just a little shift, right? So we're not talking about this big major change. You're still able to be who you are and be as authentic as you should be. And also just a little tiny shift of, you know, I just want to share this and no expectations of what's going to happen after that. You're actually sharing for yourself as the caregiver. You're not looking for, okay, I'm going to start taking my meds every day. Or you're not looking for, uh, you know, oh, how can I help you? You just want to be able to share it with the person that you know loves you. And you know, deep down, no matter what, uh, whatever emotion you're experiencing, it's 99.9% .9 linked to love. It's linked to connection. It's linked to um, that, that, that family member that you have in your life. These shifting roles aren't just between parents and kids. I mean, roles can shift in all sorts of family relationships with siblings and all. Um, can you just speak to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I'll I'll share a little bit about my uh, my nuclear family, um, and that might help a little bit. Um, in that, I have a brother that lives in Connecticut, and I have a sister that lives in Florida. And I live in New Jersey um, and my parents live with me with my adult sister um, that has a disability that requires 24-7 uh, care. Um, she can't be left alone. She requires to be um, to be fed, to be um, all of her ADLs, everything. Um, that's in addition to my parents having their own medical uh, diagnoses, right? So uh, that dynamic that plays out is... Uh, they've been living with me for almost three years now. And prior to that, they were living with my brother in Connecticut. Uh, so culturally, we come from a space where we just wouldn't even consider uh, a group home or a nursing home or anything other than living with uh, immediate family. Um, and that's something that my brother and my sister, uh, we're all clear about. That's never been in question, um, even just growing up. It, it's just something that we just know that we always do. So some of those dynamics that you're talking about is me being the youngest in our family. And um, I, I've i kind of gotten into this role of being the, the communicator, right? And obviously outside of being a therapist, <laughs> which, which kind of comes in handy. But I'm a communicator, meaning uh, my parents, and this is a regular thing, um, every couple of months. Uh, we'll send a text to my brother and my sister and me saying, um, we are going to the emergency room for your sister. Um, she's having seizures and we can't um, control it. So my role as the communicator is either I'm the one that knows about it and I text them. Um, or um, if I happen to be at work, once I get that text, I call my mom immediately and I just gather as much information because... For her to have to explain it to to three or four or five, and then my aunt calls, and then my cousin calls. So 
uh, it's not like a science, but it's come down to, okay, Robbie's just going to give us the information. So even after my mom has called my brother on occasion, he's called me back and said, hey, can you tell me what's like going on? And that's a role that um, it makes sense. It works for me. Uh, whereas my sister, who lives in Florida, she's a nurse. So when my parents and my other sister are with her in Florida, uh, my sister is more of the medical assessor. So she will um, talk to the uh, talk to the doctors at the emergency room. She will kind of uh, you know take her experience and take her um, her gut, and she'll talk it through with my mom. Uh, what's best for my sister. Mind you, my mom is a nurse also. She's a retired nurse. So the roles are kind of changing. Whereas when I was growing up, I wasn't the communicator. I was, you know, again, I was the baby, even as a teenager, I was the baby of the family. I, I, you know, as if you, if you ask my brother, my brother and sister paved the way for me. So I had the easy, they had the easy route of which, you know, there are definitely some truths to that. Um, where so those uh those roles change a little bit um and it's not something that was always there and um i it it, it took a little time in the beginning for me at least to adjust to that role um but i'm sure that there are other people that kind of experience these uh these changes of roles um either sooner in life or um it may not be as easy for them as i said i'm a therapist um one of the things i do every day is communicate I listen and I, uh, you know, I partner with uh, people. Um, so if I weren't in the field and these weren't, this wasn't a skill set that I was comfortable with, uh, sometimes communicating stuff to other people is, is not that easy. So I, I invite us to kind of acknowledge and recognize that when these roles shift and change, it's okay to feel a little clumsy about it. It's okay to feel Here's a big one, overwhelmed about it. Uh, it's okay to feel all the feelings that you're having about it uh, because it is a change. And I imagine there's a grieving process of like, well, this is not who I used to be in the family. I I used to be the cute baby of the family. Like, how am I the one everyone's relying on to communicate well? Um, mm. There's there's some loss, I think. Absolutely. And I, I know from my my mom and dad, uh, one of the things that they um, are amazing about is uh, when they need help, they'll need help. But also one of the things that I'd like we're working on is that um, when they need help, you need to ask for help, right? So there, there's that there's that that balancing act of the first question we typically get is, are you busy? Uh, you know, do you have a second to talk? And if you ask my brother and my sister, uh, it doesn't matter where we are in life. If something needs to be done for my parents or my sister uh, with a disability, um, we just drop it. We, we'd like drop everything. We could be at the airport. Um, and and that's not that's that's not even a badge of honor. That's just the way we were raised. We, we were raised that you, you know, you just do what you need to do for your family. And here we are hearing in my our parents voice a little bit of, oh, we don't want to bother you. And then again, that whole dynamic of becoming a parent, just tell us it's okay. Like, don't worry. And we can likely translate that my parents are feeling a little guilt or are feeling a little, I don't want to bother them. Um, so, you know, these are the things like, and here's a perfect example. My mom was in Connecticut uh, a couple of weekends ago. And um, this is not, this is something that, um, I don't want to say I take for granted, but I never thought of is that when you're going somewhere for like, like maybe seven or eight days, you have to count medications and you need to pack. And when you have a daughter, an adult daughter that has multiple medications, uh, your husband has multiple medications and you have multiple medications, that is a bag alone of just medications and liquid pills, uh, injection, you name it, we, we have it. And she texted me and she said, um, I'm going to run out of one of the meds. Um, can, can we figure out how to, how to get it to Connecticut? And, you know, of course I was like, sure. And she, and then she's like, are you busy again? That whole, you know, when only when, when you get a chance, oh, well, sure. Great. <laughs> so, you know, able to, you know, to communicate with her, work it out, you know, get it there. And then 
on the uh, on the opposite end, I sent it through the mail and it didn't arrive the way it was supposed to. So here I am freaking out saying, oh man, it was supposed to be guaranteed at six o'clock and it didn't get there. And I'm on the phone with her saying, I will drive up to to bring it. It's two and a half hours. She's like, no, no, um, I'm I'm sure it'll it'll get here by tomorrow. I have enough for tomorrow morning. And then I'm like, well, what if it doesn't get there by tomorrow? Um, I'm looking up Uber to see if they can, you know, drive a package two and a half hours. I'll drive an hour to New York City and it's only an hour. Like this is what happens in your head, right? So um, th this is what happens when you're communicating with your parents and there are various levels of feelings that are involved in various levels and layers of care. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you made me think of so many things. I'm trying to choose a path here. You know, two, two things primarily stood out about the story you've told. One is um, that one of these roles you're trying to navigate in your family is, is a sibling role. And it made me think, you know, I, I'm also the youngest in my family. I'm not the youngest of four. I'm the youngest of two, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I am used to being the baby of the family. And when mm -hmm. moments, when moments come up where I feel like I want to look out for my big sister, it is sort of disorienting. It's like, well, she's my big sister. Um, <laughs> you know, why, why am I worried for her, protecting her, looking out for her? But you know what? It's because we're old now. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> and, and things have changed. And, you know, the three years age difference means nothing when you're 39 and 42. Um, and so that's one shifting role. But the other thing that stood out from your story is the concern that your mom has about, I don't know if I just said had past tense or has present tense, but even that's interesting. <laughs> um, let's go with present tense. The concern, present. the concern your mom has about accepting help um, worrying that she may be bothering you or burdening you or, or interrupting your day. And as I was listening, I, I couldn't help but think of my own family. And I thought, you know, all I mean, it's already true that my mom is terrible at accepting help, but right now it doesn't matter that much. She doesn't need that much help with things. And all I kept thinking was when the time comes though, that she absolutely does need help. I think, I don't think she's going to be very good at accepting mm. it. Mm. Wow. That is, uh, that's a big, uh, a big picture to know that might happen for you. Right. That's big because you're just like, wait a minute, but you really need it. So what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean for your, for I, your yeah. help? <laughs> in, in present day, you know, there are little ways I try to help my mom and she quickly goes, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Well, today it's okay. I can just back off and be like, all right, you got it. No problem. But there's going to come a time where I'm going to look at her and be like, woman, right. <laughs> you, you're going to have to let me help you. And that's going to be a tough one. So so here's something that I find helpful for me. And, and I'm going to pose this question to you, whether it's about your mom or just individuals in general. When there's uh, an action that I, I'm not sure, like, I don't agree with, right? Like, let's just say I don't agree. Like, hey, you need help. Accept the help. Um, one of the things I'm starting to do and I'm doing more often is asking myself, not why they're saying no, but what are they feeling that's making them feel no, right? And you see that little shift. So in instead of uh, why are you not listening or why are you not taking taking my uh, support, or it's so clear that you need it. So my question to you is when someone is refusing or not wanting the help, what are some of the feelings that they might be having? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm imagining, again, we're talking about probably a future moment, sure. al al although not, not that far in the future, but um, <laughs> I'm imagining for my mom, it feels for a, a tough woman like she is really vulnerable. Uh, um, yes. And it's also a displacement of her role. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. 
Isn't yeah. that amazing? A change of displacement and roles, not just for the kids, but for the parents as well. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Which I imagine is disorienting and, you know, it's, it's, it's the kind of thing that we'll have to navigate together, but you make a good point, Ravi, rather than me saying, why mom, why can't I help you? It may go a lot further to say, I know this is hard for both of us. This is a big change for both of us. Things aren't the way they used to be. And that's tough. We could just acknowledge that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And when we're, when we're able to acknowledge it for them, we're almost able to uh, give them a space of acceptance, right? Like it's okay. What's the, uh, the, the good old therapist phrase, name it to tame it. Uh, so if you can name your feelings, even just like acknowledging what they are, they somehow become a little tamer. I, I still can't figure out why that works so well, but it does. <laughs> like <laughs> I've had moments just, yeah, right? just, just like the other day. I, um, I don't know. I was, I was feeling just very emo emotional and I, I was feeling like tearful and couldn't even figure out like what is going on with me. And I sat down and just tried to like logic my way through like what the heck happened in my day that has me like hanging by a thread right now. And as I thought it through, I identified some things that probably have me, you know, feeling all sorts of emotions and once I was able to name them, I really was like, well, I actually feel like a million times better now. Name it to tame it. I love that. I absolutely love that. Yeah. Um, it's 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 a beautiful way of just relieving a little bit of whatever you're feeling, uh, you know, and kind of like acknowledging it. And it's 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 great. And definitely encourage anyone that's either uh, you know taking care of uh, a family member or even knowing that a friend uh, is taking care of their uh, family members. Um, that's definitely an easy thing to do, right? Asking a question, what does this feel like? Uh, how would you describe that versus focusing on the action and the behavior, right? Focusing on, they didn't want to go to the appointment or I took off from work and, you know, they were late. And then, you know, you're supposed to bring your Medicare card and you didn't. And, uh, and yeah, there's a lot of things that are happening. There's a lot of behaviors that are you're, you're feeling and seeing. Um, and also beautiful thing to just be like, I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated. It's a beautiful thing to say. I'm disappointed. I'm, I'm deflated. I just, I'm tired. I yeah. don't know. I'm just, and I don't see an end. Um, I feel like I'm running a marathon that never ends. That's something I've uh, shared uh, and I've heard uh, from people. And uh, my thing is, uh, you know, if you're running a marathon, that's you don't see the uh, the end. Uh, what do they have um, during marathons? They have places where you can drink water, right? They have places to take care of your body, whether it's a, a 5K, 10K, half marathon, a marathon or more. So hydrate, drink water. That's my big, big thing that I don't do enough, but uh, I say to everyone, take care of your body. Uh, give it uh, water and fluids when it, you need it. Even if you don't feel that you need it, drink, uh, eat, make sure that you're eating and you're giving your body fuel, rest, make sure if you're ever, if you've ever seen marathon, not everyone runs the entire time. Right. If you've ever seen a 5K, not everyone runs the entire time and that's OK. So sometimes we need to walk. Sometimes we need to stop and keel over and take a few breaths, tie our shoe. And then we can, can continue that endless marathon. But take care of your body. Ravi, I have run a marathon and I cried for seven miles. <laughs> <laughs> but you got yeah. through it. There them. was, there was an end. Um, right. Yeah. And, and to your point about water, crying for seven miles is a quick way to dehydrate yourself. <laughs> so. <laughs> so what I'm hearing is feel all the feelings too. So yep. drink, drink your water, uh, tie your shoes, cry, cry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Laugh, 
right? Uh, <laughs> do all experience all the feel yell at the people that are not running that are cheering you on. <laughs> If you need to do that, that's okay. Uh, what what I did, I didn't run a, a my, uh, I ran a half marathon a few times, and one of the things I love more than anything is looking at the signs that people bring to uh, 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 like a running event. So I I ran the Brooklyn half marathon uh, a few times, and uh, some of my favorites were "What's going on?" with a big question mark. <laughs> And the person has this big smile on their face. The other one is um, I heart runners. Um, I, I, I slept in this morning, like really like just amazingly comical to me signs that when you're in, in it and you're running, uh, you're hearing cheering people cheering you on. And also it's a distraction. It's a way of yeah. just being like, you know, so um, yeah, I, I, I love I love knowing that we can feel all the feelings and yeah. that's being okay. I mean, I laugh about it, but there is something interesting. The only way you can cry for seven miles is if you keep going. Um, if I had started crying and stopped, well, I would have said, oh, I, I cried for, you know, 10 feet. But I cried for seven miles because my crying didn't stop me. Yeah, I kept putting one foot in front of the other, even though I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was a wreck, but yeah. you can be a wreck and just keep going. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, and this is, this is where we're at. Um, and it's, it's always been this way in the world is that, you know, we're typically our, our biggest critics, right. And we typically feel um, a certain way when something happens and we um, anticipate if we're having a hard time or if we're struggling or if it's going a little off that it's, it's, it's like, ah, oh, I can't believe it. When to me, that's a badge of honor, like rock on Kate, you cried and you, you allowed yourself to feel what you were feeling and like, Oh, how beautiful. And you put one step in front of the other and you continued. And to me, that is just like amazing. And I think more of us need to remind not just ourselves, but, our 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 friends and our loved ones like it's okay to cry it's okay to feel frustrated it's okay to feel shame and guilt uh when we're navigating challenging things in life uh we don't have it's it isn't it doesn't have to be you know the word perfect the word perfect doesn't exist uh it doesn't have to, and it may be different than how we anticipated it was going to be like we can have this really challenging goal ahead of us. And okay, uh, you know, my family member is going to have surgery. So I've taken a few days off from work and then I'm going to be there for them after. And I've gotten all my projects done and I've arranged everything in order. And that plan can collapse and there can be complications and there can be an extension in the second surgery. And that's okay. And we can feel overwhelmed when that's happening. We can cry. We can get frustrated and that's okay. And I think that's the beauty that I love hearing is, you know, just put one foot in front of the other. And if you need to just pause, right. Uh, you know, just, just sit on the, on, 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 the, on the pavement and just sit. And when you're ready, you get up and you keep going. And if you need help, uh, the last time I ran, um, I wasn't as ready as the first time. And there was, uh, I'll never forget this woman who was, running with us it was, and it felt like there was a pack of us that were running and all she was was inspiration for everyone else she was calling out come on we're on mile 11 we got 2.1 uh 2.6 miles we got this and after like and i don't know her i don't i don't know who she is a half mile later i turned to her and i said hey can you scream a little bit please because i needed that and she's like, I got you. I got you, brother. And she just was going at it. And I was like, oh, thank you. So reach out for help. Reach out to the people that you love. Reach out to the people that you trust. Uh, reach out to uh, supports that are out there. Uh, you don't have to do it alone. You yeah. definitely don't have to do it alone. Yeah. The story that I'm about to share, and I'll do it quickly because we're definitely running out of time, but um, is actually in the only trying to help book. So the audience, if you, if you happen to have a copy, you may have heard or read the story, but when I was running the marathon and I was crying, 
there were people on the side of the road, you know, cheering, encouraging. And mostly I kind of found them annoying because I was like, shut up. You're not running right now. Um, <laughs> Love it. But but there was one woman who saw me upset and she put her she was drinking a beer. She put her beer down. She put her sign down and she got into the street and ran with me. Now, running is a loose term. I was hobbling at this point, but she kind of hobbled with me. Total stranger side by side with me, just Um, went with me. And she just sort of whispered calming things like, you know, it will end soon. Like she didn't overdo it. Like if she had gotten in my ear and been like, let's go girl. I would have been like (laughs) middle finger in the air, get out of my face. But she seemed to understand that I needed like a subtler cheering. And she came with me. Yes. I mean, Kate, I she, love it. She partnered with you. She, she came walked, with me. She, she, she literally and figuratively was side by side with you. And also she read you, right? Because uh, she, she clearly knew that the approach was to just kind of subtle comments. Uh, and I love that. I love that. And I believe we all have that in us is that not everyone needs to be encouraged the same way. And not everyone responds the same way. And the beauty is, you know, trusting your relationships and your instincts. And as I said earlier, when you're dancing with someone, if you step on their toe, uh, that's okay. So if I start off and I go into my space of like, come on, let's go. And it's not uh, having an impact and I can adjust. I can be like, what is it? Or I can ask, hey, what do you need right now? Um, You know, and the beauty is knowing that whether it's a stranger or uh, a person, uh, you you can have support and you can feel that they're running right next to you. Yeah. She put her beer down. <laughs> that, let me tell you, uh, that that is so many things I could say about that. That is amazing. It's, it's, I'm going to say that. It's her, it's heroic. I think it's heroic. <laughs> I, I think, and also it, it really comes down to, um, a little bit of like like this humanistic like when you see someone that really needs help um that's that's the thing to do and beautiful it's beautiful when we hear about it we see it we experience moments where humans are humans and they they kind of take care of each other um and um it wasn't that she was just trying to help she was helping so Mm -hmm. how how beautiful She's also a total stranger who doesn't know she's in my book. She's on my podcast. Um, So it makes me wonder sometimes in those little moments in life, when you help somebody out, you have no idea for how many decades they may be talking about you. Like, you don't know you you're a hero in someone's life and you don't even know it. We all are. We all are. You know, we, we have those moments and, and that, and that's the beauty of kind of waking up every day is that you have a chance to just be your most authentic self. There's no doubt she did not wake up that morning saying, I'm going to look for somebody that needs help and I'm going to, no, that didn't happen. We all know that. That was in the moment she was acting on instinct and beautiful, just an amazing story. Yeah. I owe her a beer for the one that she put down. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Thank you so much, Ravi, for doing this again. Um, You know, I have been telling everybody I've been trying to keep these episodes a lot shorter and you and I just went on because (laughs) it's, it's too fun. Um, This is awesome, Kate. Thank you so much. Is there anything that you didn't get to say that you really wanted to say? I just wanted to close with saying thank you again for bringing me on. Um, As I said, after the first one, when we were done, uh, it's supernatural and easy to talk to you and to talk about things that are important uh, to me. And um, I just, I really appreciate this. And I hope that um, for those that are listening, that uh, more conversations can be had about uh, caring for others. And uh, we can all kind of like, kind of lean into the feelings.